Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Fourth Dimension Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. My name is Don, and I'm an alcoholic and your chairperson. Let us open the meeting with a moment of silence, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Our singleness of purpose. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're glad you're all here, especially newcomers. In keeping with our singleness of purpose and our third tradition, which states that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking, we ask that all who participate confine their discussion to their problems with alcohol. Is there anyone present who is at their first meeting or in their first 30 days of sobriety? If so, please introduce yourself. We ask this not to embarrass you, but so that we may get to know you better. I'm Ryan, I'm an alcoholic. Amen. Justin. I'm Max, I'm an alcoholic. Amen. I'm Annette. Hi, Annette. Anybody else? Is that it? Okay. Is there anyone here from out of town? Yes. I'm Gail. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Gail. I'm from the big city of Chocolate Springs. Oh, Okay. I don't want to go through the yellow pages. Okay. <laughs> get, with, get with somebody after the meeting. And um, Scotty will read the preamble. Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Herman, and I am an alcoholic. The Alcoholic Anonymous Preamble. Alcoholic Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. Does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither in endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and to help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Thanks, Scotty. All right. And Eric will now read the steps. Hello, everyone. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Eric. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked Him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, we made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11. Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. And 12. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and practice these principles in all our affairs. Thanks, Eric. Um, if you have an empty seat beside you, will you raise your hand for the folks in back standing up? Thanks. All right, if you could please silence your cell phones at this time. Also, we ask if you could please refrain from getting up and down during the speakers, but if you must, please do so quietly. 
If you're going to smoke, we ask you to please be away from any buildings. Please be respectful as we are guests of the church. Also, if you have any announcements in between speakers, please see the group secretary. Group secretary, raise your hand. All right, this time I'd like to introduce the first speaker. This is Danielle. Thank you, Don, for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> All right, I... Um, Sometimes I try to crack jokes and I'm the worst joke maker. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, I can laugh at them. Hello, Danielle. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I'd like to say this is a really intimidating meeting. I'm not sure why. Um, I don't need to analyze that necessarily, but... <laughs> Uh, it's truly an honor to, to be in the rooms of AA, to be in other fellowships, and, and to have the friends that I have today, and, and the people who are in my life and who have helped carry me through times that, um, really struggling times. This has not been easy. Uh, oh, has it been rewarding? Yes, yes, yes. My, my life, everything is a spiritual story today. Um... I recently went for an interview, and the therapist who interviewed me asked me, you know, she's like, well, what, what theory do you best like to work with? And, you know, three years ago, I didn't know what the word theory meant. And today, you know, I'm, you know, I just, ah, I get to learn all this stuff and, and really retain it. Because of, because of the past I've had, um, I had a very, very, very hard childhood. I probably have experienced everything there is to experience. I probably have done everything bad that there is to do. And I am so truly proud of that. Why? Because, because stories like last year on Christmas when a girl walked in. Well, I had to go to the store. I messed up Christmas dinner. And thank God Walgreens was open. <laughs> and... This girl walks in and she she was dressed like a hooker, and instead of instead of instead of instead of judging her, I understood that, and, and then it reminded me, wow, you know, I'm sophisticated looking today. I don't like to dress like the way I used to dress. Um, most of the time, I don't like to wear makeup either, and and things like that are just a miracle in itself. But that's that's just scratching the surface. So the therapist lady asked me what theory I mostly like to work with, and I actually could answer her. I actually could retain that, and my mind wasn't just thinking about alcohol or, or where I was going to get my next drink from. I, I could think about other things. I can remember things, and I know who I am. You know, at the end of the day, I think that the most important thing is I know who I am, and I'm not perfect, and I'm proud of that. So, you know, the theory that I do like the most is relations theory. Um, my spiritual stories are based on this blueprint from my childhood. Um, I, I grew up and I had these struggles and you know I didn't necessarily get to heal from them then because I just went out drinking and numbing myself and, and today everything that I do um, you know is well, what relations theory is is it's me and you are interacting like the um, how we were raised. You know we're, we're raised our, our parents and our sisters have us, you know, interact in these ways, sometimes not mostly healthily, especially when we end up in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, and I get to learn from that today. I get to heal from that blueprint of my childhood. And that's what I'm doing all the time. And it is so hard to do to, like, purge, purge my past. Um, and it's, it's just so beautiful. You know, my mom's mentally ill, and I went with her yesterday to to the National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI. It's a, it's a mental illness, like, annual Christmas party that they have. And, and I was really, really, really proud to be there with her. And uh, I had such a good time with her, and I learned some really funny stories about her. And, and I just love my mom today, and I think the world of her. <sighs> and, and I'm just so honored to have a mother who is mentally ill. And I just recently learned this semester that there's a stigma on mental illness. You know, it's like I didn't know anything before I came in the rooms, and I've learned all of this. And yeah, I can see where people stigmatize, sure. Um, you know, but like, it doesn't matter to me. I'm just like so proud 
of my experiences and who I am. And this, these rooms gave me that pride I have. The, the fourth and the fifth step taught me that I can change those character defects and turn them into assets and be proud of the bad things that I've done. And, um, you know, and, and just remember them, but not remember, like, the guilt that's associated with, with, with those feelings. And I've, I've experienced such freedom. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I wanted to go back to school really bad, and I couldn't get there. And I would fill out an application every time that I was, well, I was always drunk. Um, so I had a lot of applications, <laughs> and if they weren't all the way filled out, they weren't turned in. And um, and I never even made it to the school to turn them in because I just couldn't get there. That's how unhealthy I was. I always had the shakes, and you know, I weighed nothing, and. And um, you know, my mind would take me somewhere else before I could get to the school. And 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 today, you know, I'm I'm going to finish my bachelor's degree next semester, and I'm getting ready to go into an agency. And you know, I made dean's list. And um, ah, for you, it's not too. It's not an easy school. And then I'm going to top it off with with this with this story. You know, I went to an agency, and I'm going to be I'm working for an agency where, when I was 20, um, you know, I was Baker acted by this agency, and I'm working for them today. And, and if that's not a miracle, and if that doesn't give you hope tonight, I don't know what else will, but um, I love the stories I have. I wish I could tell them all to you. They're, they're magnificent, and I, and I got them here from you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Diana will now read the traditions. <coughs> Hi, I'm Diana. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, thank you so much, Danielle. It has been an honor to see how much you've grown. You are just a wonderful lady. And all of us that know you are so proud of you, and we all love you very much. Um, the short form of the 12 traditions. One, our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. Two, for our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. Three, the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. Four, each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Five, each group should have but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Six, an AA group ought never endorse, finance, or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise. And thus problems of money, property, and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. Seven, every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. Eight, Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever unprofessional, but our service centers may employ special workers. Nine, AA as such ought never be organized, but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. Ten, Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues, hence the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. Eleven, our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio, and films. And Twelve, anonymity is the spiritual foundation of our traditions, never reminding us to place principles before personalities. Thanks, Diana. And Chris will now do the chips. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm alcoholic. Uh, we have a chip system to recognize lengths of sobriety, and the first one we offer is a 24 hour chip, a silver chip. For anybody new or coming back, I'd like to try this way of life. Anybody want to? Hey, all right. It's 
Ryan. Uh, well, Greg Chip. One month. Anybody have a month? Hey, maybe just. All right, that was Justin, and we got some more here. Two more. Donna and Jennifer, and two months, gold yeah. chip. For three months? Anybody, three months. And Susan. And we offer a blue chip for six months. Brad, that normally gives out the chips, and we have a purple chip for nine months. Nine months, all right. Uh, red chip for one year, <laughs> or multiples. All right, thank you. Congratulations to everybody that picked up chips. Um, now I'd like to introduce the second speaker. This is Chris P. from St. Pete. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Chris. And um, uh, my sobriety date is June the 18th of 2008. And... Um, uh, I have a sponsor. I've had the privilege to sponsor others. I'm a member of the um, Monday Night Speakers Group in uh, St. Petersburg. We meet on uh, yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> we meet on um, at uh, we we meet on Monday nights, and it's a speaker meeting. And it's speakers group. That's a joke I stole from my sponsor. He's, and um, but where he comes from in Kentucky, that that was a real thing. There was a. Uh, uh, a Tuesday night staff group that met on Saturday mornings, and they just kept the name the same. It wasn't we going to change anything. <laughs> but um, I'm real uh, excited to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Jennifer uh, for asking me to speak and, and the group for having me out here. I love coming up to this group, getting to see Chris and, and Melanie and Joe and uh, Sean and, and just a good group of people up here. And um, my only regret is I didn't get here a little bit sooner. Um, it's, it's really good... Uh, alcoholic thinking for me, contempt prior to investigation. Uh, in previous trips up here, I have came from Pinellas County. Um, I've come with like my sponsor or a group of guys from there. So the only way I knew how to get up here was to take 19. But I live in South Tampa, and so I just I took 19. <laughs> I, I left my place. I literally came home from work, uh, showered, got, got, in the, um, got in the shower, changed, and came up here. I left at 5, and I got here about 10 to 7. <laughs> and I, I remember thinking in the shower, it would be, I'm not even going to ask anybody to come up with me because there will be no time. And it, uh, About three minutes after I got here, two of my buddies from Tampa walk in. And I was like, whoa, what do you guys... Uh, I asked them what time they left, and they said a little bit after six. <laughs> I took the veterans. I said, okay, so... I, like, I gotta know what's best for me, you know? I, I, I think I went like this to get here. But anyway, I'm really glad to be here. And, um, uh, in, a, um, in a general way, just uh, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. Um, I know... Um, for me, that was a big thing when I first came to Alcoholics Anonymous was just going to speaker meetings because um, I was able to relate. Uh, you know, I, I didn't think I was an alcoholic when I first got here. Um, I think maybe a lot of a lot of us feel that way. Maybe well, I, I can only speak for myself. I, I, you know, of course, I thought I was too young. I thought maybe it was all the um, other things I do. That's the problem in my life, but I couldn't see my um, 
my drinking or my alcoholism. So uh, speaker meetings were, you know, real important for me um, at, early on to you know, identification. Um, I come from a uh, really good family. I'm from Northeast Ohio, and um, I uh, I love the Cleveland Browns. I'm a huge Cleveland Browns fan, and um, that's thank you. Wow, really another one? And uh, and uh, that's that's essentially the reason I drank is because I'm a fan of the Browns. So uh, obviously not true. I drink because I'm an alcoholic. Um, but uh, I come from a really good family. Um, no alcoholics in my family. And um, and uh, so even if I wanted to blame my alcoholism on somebody, I, I, there'd be nobody to blame it on, as far as I know. Um, my sister, my parents, grandparents on both sides, non-alcoholic. Um, you know, it's, I, I got the golden ticket in the, in the family. <laughs> um, I uh, First time I was drunk in my life was... I was 16 years old. I was a, a junior in high school, and um, I went to visit my uh, my older sister, who went to Ohio University, and they had this event called Little Siblings Weekend. And um, yeah, and, and I remember hearing about it, and it sounded just really lame to me, like Little Siblings Weekend. I didn't know, you know, what that entitled or what that all meant. But um, I talked to a friend of mine who went, and she said it was a really good time. She had a lot of fun. So. Um, when the next year rolled around, I was, I was a junior in high school, and so I signed up to go to this event. And um, pretty much what it was, was you, you just go down to college. Uh, it was a college town, and uh, she went to Ohio University, and, um, you know, they, they kind of, I took a bus down there, and they, my sister met me at the bus station, and, um, you know, we, she lived in a sorority house, and we just, uh, there was no, like, organized events or anything like that. You just kind of went to the, to the college and hung out with your older sibling, and, um, so, you know, we just did what I considered, you know, the college thing. We just uh, went from, like, house party to house party. And, um, you know, it, it, it also, um, I'll talk about that in a second. I, uh, up until this point, I'd never been drunk before, but I, I definitely um, experimented with alcohol in the sense that I'd been to parties um, where, you know, people were drinking, and um, I always... Uh, wanted to fit in, you know, it was very important that I be perceived as, you know, cool, um, yeah, that was like the most important thing to me, especially like, I can remember going, the summer before going into high school, that was like, life or death, that I'd be like, accepted and like, uh, run with, you know, who I thought was the popular crowd, and, you know, very image conscious, early on, from early on, and, um, so I'd be at parties where there was alcohol being served, and, um, if other people were doing it, of course, I would want to do it too, just to fit in, um, and I tried to drink, like I really tried, I just didn't, um, I couldn't stand the taste of beer. And I literally couldn't get through a half of a beer. And, um, because it just, it, it tasted so bad. Um, so, but on, on this particular night, I, um, I'm sure I felt uncomfortable because I was hanging out with all these, you know, college kids, but, um, I, I, I guess I got over that because I don't remember starting to drink that night. But um, but I do remember when I caught a buzz, when I, that buzz kicked in for the, you know for the first time, and again I, before this I I, I didn't see um I, I didn't get drinking I, I always associated it with um like a, a more mature adult thing um my, my dad who I, I really really respect and look up to to this day um, drinks um, but he's not an alcoholic uh, so I, I you know I saw him and and, and just it's always something like the older crowd was drinking. Um, as a young kid, all, all these movies I would watch growing up, um, the way I perceived it was that alcohol equals fun and party time, and that's just what you do when you get to be about 16 or 17. You go to way to college. You know, I, I remember watching like Revenge of the Nerds, like like the frat boy uh, movies, and, and you know, and, and just thinking that's what you do when you get older. Um, so, and I can remember being being at parties and. and uh, and having to have something in my hand, even at, right before until I got sober, if I was at a club or a bar, I felt uncomfortable um, until I at least had a beer or something in my hand to hold. Because it was like I was just like, what do I do with my hands? I don't know until like, you know. I, but if I had a, a beer or something, then I can kind of just feel a little more relaxed and you know comfortable. Um, so on this night um, in College Town, where I caught a, a buzz for the first time, I remember we were leaving one party and we we're going to another one. And I remember saying to my sister, I said, hey, Kel, I, said, I think I'm drunk. 
And uh, she kind of just rolled her eyes and, and said, really? But I mean, then I remember thinking, so this is what everybody's been talking about. You know, this is what the big deal is all about. And I was like, man, this is like the, this is the greatest thing ever. And, um, and so, you know, alcoholic tendencies right out, um, right off the bat, I, uh, you know, I got really, really drunk that night. And, um, you know, the next morning I remember dry heaving, being really sick. And uh, I remember asking my sister, um, it was the next day, like in the afternoon, and I was still sick. And I remember going to my sister again saying, um, Kel, uh, something's wrong. I think, you, I think I have to go to the doctor. And she just rolled her eyes again. And she goes, you, you're just hungover. And um, I didn't know what a hangover was. And I thought, oh. And I thought it was kind of cool. I like, oh, I'm hungover. Yeah, all right. And um, I can remember getting ready to go out that night. This was Saturday night. And I'm um, still feeling kind of queasy. And um, asking myself, am I going to drink tonight? And I thought, well, of course. And um, that's what I did. I, I did the exact same thing the next night. And... Um, I got really, really drunk, and, and uh, the next morning, I remember taking the bus back home, saying to myself, you know, just don't throw up on the bus, uh, you know, don't just make it home, and um, I, I made it home okay without throwing up, but um, for a long time, I referred to that weekend as like, the greatest weekend of my life, and, you know, looking back on it, um, you know, uh, there was no supervision, no parents, you know, I was free to drink, and... Um, and I, uh, my, like I mentioned, my sister lived in a sorority house, and on the Saturday night, I, I made out with her uh, uh, sorority sister, who was 21 at the time, and I was 16. So, man, you know, this was like the greatest thing, the greatest weekend ever. And I like to think, if that girl's sober today, when she shares, she talks about a time where she made out with her friend's little brother, and she was so drunk. <laughs> um... But really, the reason it was such a profound weekend was because alcohol had entered my life. And I remember on the, on the bus ride down there, on the bus they showed two movies. They showed Toy Story 1 and the Nutty Professor remake with Eddie Murphy. And like for years after that, I would like see those movies and I'd like start reminiscing. Because like I associated those movies with that weekend. And, um, you know, that's, I don't think normal drinkers do that. <laughs> um, it was explained to me that... Um, you know, maybe a hard drinker, or, you know, might go out and, and, and do all that stuff, and, and the next day say, "Wow, you know, that last night was a really good time. That was, that was a lot of fun." Whereas alcoholic, you know, will say, "Wow, that was life changing." <laughs> and, um, you know, and I, I didn't realize that at the time. I, I uh, you know, um, I, I never made that connection. You know, and, and like, why would I? And from there, um, things things rolled along, and you know, I. I uh, um, it was hard to get alcohol all the time when I was 16 or 17, but every now and then somebody's older brother would get it for us, and uh, um, you know. And but see, I thought I, I thought I had figured it out because I said I couldn't stay. I never did end up liking the taste of beer, even up until when I got sober. Um, that's why I never understood going out and having just a couple of beers after work, which um, you know I, I was never able to do that. But I really thought it was because. I didn't like the taste of beer. Um, like I really thought if I drink enough of it, I'll acquire a taste for it, like I did coffee, and I'll be able to have a few. Yeah, I mean, that's just cra crazy thinking. And um, you know, and uh, but what I didn't know was that one and a half beers is not going to do anything for me. So what's what's the point? Um, I remember, uh, and, and that's how my disease would lie to me. Like when I first came in, and now I would remember these things. Or, uh, you know, in like when I used to work at a restaurant, we would, we would do wine tasting sometimes before we opened the doors for evening. And I remember not wanting to do it because, but I, but I thought it was because I didn't like wine. Well, no, it was because we, you're going to get that much wine, maybe two glasses of that to try a couple, you know, and what's, who wants to do that, you know? <laughs> and um, so uh, I thought I would figured it out. So when I started drink, I always drink to drink to get drunk. Um, you know, I didn't think there was any other reason to drink alcohol. So um, I, I would slam like the first three beers, and then once I got, you know, about three in, into four, then I, you know, buzz would kick in, and, you know, then it, it didn't matter. Um, you know, and I was off and running, and I just thought that's how it was. So I started to notice my dad. I mentioned my dad is not an alcoholic. He, um, when I started to drink the way I drink, I would, um, see him drinking his beer on the weekends and um but then I also I noticed I would never see him drunk ever um so I asked him one time I said uh I said dad how many when you drink how many beers do you drink when you drink your beer <laughs> and he thought about it for a second he goes ah, he goes I have about three or four and 
I start to feel it, and so I stop. And um, I remember thinking, you know, why would you, what's the point of doing that? Why would you do that? And, um, but, you know, that's, I, I just thought, well, that's my dad. He's different because he's my dad, you know. I saw that mentality when, when you're 18, and, and that's like, you know, he doesn't count. That's just, I guess, what he does. It doesn't make any sense to me. But, um, you know, alcohol affects my father differently than it affects me. And, uh, but, you know, I never pieced any of that t- together. And, again, why, why would I? Um, uh, when I was, um, let's see, I graduated from college, and uh, when I was about 10 years old, I, um, I always wanted to be a uh, professional wrestler, and I just thought it was just the coolest thing. Um, when I was 20 years old, I wanted to be a professional wrestler, <laughs> and uh, so, um, yeah, and, and so, uh, I, don't, I don't know why, I, it, you know, it's just, I, I just thought it was just the neatest thing. It combined everything I liked, you know, like, like theater, athletics, and, uh, and, and, all, and all this. And um, I, um, um, it's the reason I started, like, working out and trying to get in shape and everything. And then, so my parents said, you know, when I was, when I was about 20, they said, if, if you really want to do this, you know, we'll, we'll be supportive of you. Just, just stay in school and, you know, finish your education. And, um, uh, and what do you know, my, my parents were right, because... Ten years later, my, my degree would come in handy, um, which, uh, but, um, you know, and I always say I got out of uh, college in time before my disease progressed, because like, this is definitely progressive in its nature, and um, so, uh, but anyway, I, um, I started traveling to, um, to Louisville, Kentucky, because, you know, to, to get into to the wrestling world, you, you, you need to get trained, and, and you need to find someone who will train you, and, 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 and to learn the craft, and so, um, I couldn't find anything where I lived, and I had to stay at home because I was in school back in Youngstown, Ohio. So I found a place in Louisville, Kentucky that, that met on Saturdays, and I thought, um, uh, okay, I could do that. I, I can go to school during the week, and I train on the weekends. Um, the only problem was, was Louisville was six hours away from, from where I lived, um, but um, you know, that, that didn't stop me. And this is where I, this is my opinion. I, I, I feel we as alcoholics are often very you know, determined uh, strong-willed people, um, which I find it kind of ironic, you know, that, that willpower is to no avail of, you know, <laughs> stopping curing alcoholism. Um, but, but I, you know, it's like you, you hear telling an alcoholic they can't do something, you know, like, oh, by God, I'll, sh- I'll show you. And, um, you know, when I first read Bill's story, I, I, like, my, my wrestling was like Bill's, you know, Wall Street. And um, I can remember... Uh, there's that line in the big book where Bill says uh, something to the effect of, um, in Bill's story, where, where he says, I would show the world I was something at last. Something to that effect. And, um, you know, I remember a friend of mine pointed out, he said, uh, why would you ever feel the need to have to do that? And um, I was like, well, that's true. And that's how I felt. You know, I just felt like, you know, I'll show you. And, and um, so that, that's, what I, uh, that's what I started to do. I, I, you know, I would travel down there on the weekends and... Um, I made a nice little routine out of it because I, I I would stop at Ohio State, which was the halfway point, and party with my friends all night, and wake up like at seven on Saturday morning, go down there and train, and get beat up, and come home, and uh, and um, yeah, it was fun. And, and uh, um, so things moved along with that, and um, eventually I started, you know, I met the right people, and um, you know, it was. This, it was God in my life. Um, he's been there the whole time. And for some reason, God put that in my heart to want to do it. And, and I have the ability to be good at it. Um, you know, it's kind of a unique thing, you know. Um, it, my buddy used to say um, that this one guy was really talented, and um, but he had a terrible attitude. And my friend would always say, man, that's a shame because he's really good at fake fighting. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, so... Things went along, and, and you know, and I end up, and I, um, I end up getting a contract with uh, with uh, World Wrestling Entertainment, which was, which is like the main, you know, the main uh, wrestling league in the in the in the world, and um, they're an international company, and uh, so it's like being signed to a minor league baseball team. They, they give you a, the, what's called a developmental contract first, and I was 23, and um, I had a I was working. From, for the company I always wanted to work for since I was a little kid, and man, it was a lot of fun. And you go and you, you wrestle and you travel around, and um, but this is where um, you know, my alcoholism really started to take off. And uh, it's kind of like that, you know, lifestyle was, um, you know, almost encouraged, you know, in a way. And, um, you know, believe me, it was all me, but, but it's like, that was also kind of, that, that it was a fast paced environment and, um, and all that. And uh, so I, um, uh, 
I remember after a couple of years, I, I got the call that I was going to go up to the uh, up to the main show, and uh, I was real excited. And this is like you know what I worked my whole life for, and um, so uh, I remember when I went out that uh, I was supposed to leave on a Tuesday to go up to Stanford, Connecticut, and uh, and do all this like filming, film all this stuff for our debut on TV. And um, I remember Friday night we went out, and um, uh, you know just getting crazy like I would always do and Saturday morning I woke up in the hospital about 3 p.m. Um, and last thing I remember was you know the night before and that's a strange feeling you know when you when you wake up in the, in the hospital bed um, I remember gagging because that the tubes down my throat and the whole deal and uh and, you know, and all my, my friends were they're coming in two at a time, and you know they, they started telling me what happened. And uh, I remember they had really freaked out looks on their faces, and um, uh, they started telling me what happened. And, and, um, what, and what happened is, I, I my drinking, I almost killed myself that night, um, just from everything I was doing. And uh, you know, and um, you know, we, we hear talk, talk about alcoholism, is, you know, a game of seconds and inches. Um, uh, our friend Chuck Schultz who passed away about two years ago from St. Pete's to talk about that. You know, a few seconds, a few inches is all what we're dealing with. And, and, and that, that was definitely my seconds and inches story. Um, you know, I remember the doctors telling me how lucky I was, and I remember thinking, you know, yeah, right. Because all I could think about, for all I knew was I fell asleep and I woke up. And um, if anything, with my alcoholic ego, I'm thinking, like, I should have died and I didn't. You know, I'm like Superman. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And then all I'm thinking about is like I, I was like I gotta get out of here to go to Connecticut on Tuesday, and, and they they told me uh, you know you, no you, you you gotta stay here we're gonna run these tests and so anyway the the company found out about it and um, I think it talks about it and there's a solution it says the alcoholic gets tight at precisely the wrong times and um, the the company had just put out um because like like all these wrestlers were, were dying like from the 80s and things just from like substance abuse problems and all that so the company put out this uh, stuff is, uh, it's called the wellness policy and it was like this, this brand new thing where they're going to do all this t uh, drug testing and, and you know and they wanted their athletes to live healthy lifestyles so they put out like this big it's like a press release and then I almost died the week that goes into effect so they didn't you know look too uh, kindly on that so I got fired and, and um <laughs> And, you know, and that was a huge consequence because I never, um, you, you know, that was probably about the biggest consequence at the time. I mean, looking back, my life had been running out of control for so, several years up to that point. But that was really the first time, you know, um, that uh, I, I really felt this thing of you know, my alcoholism because I felt like I'd lost everything. That was, you know, the one thing I wanted to, to do with my life. And that was it, you know, and, and now it, I had just thrown it away. And... Um, and really, one of the neatest things or <coughs> biggest blessings we get to have is, is you know, um, I found God will take any situation, what the world meant for harm, and make good from it. And because looking back, that literally was what I thought the worst thing that could have ever happened to me ever. And, and you know, I'm so self centered, that was like the end of my world. And, um, but looking back, you know, what a, what a blessing because it's like that's actually um, set. In trained circumstances to eventually get me sober. It took a couple, couple more years. But eventually, looking back on it, it's like I was pulled out of the situation I was in, and one thing led to another, which eventually led to me coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, thank God. And um, so um, now I felt like I lost everything. So I, I, I just, you know, I, I, um, I remember they gave me a lump sum, <laughs> which is, you know, I spent that in like two weeks. <laughs> and, uh, I remember I had my, my rent, my uh, lease was up in my apartment. I had no money to renew it, so I moved in with my ex-girlfriend at the time. And you know, I, I said I'd never do that, but um, I had nowhere to go. So sure, I, you know, after about nine months or so, I, I you know, I just didn't do anything. And you know, she um, finally got sick of me, and she kicked me out. And again, I had no place to go, so um, I moved back home with my parents back in Ohio. And, and you know, instead of being grateful. Um, there's that line, I think it's in the ninth step in the, in the big book where it says, um, if, if it were not for the uh, patience and, and loving and understanding of, of wives and, and mothers, many of us would be dead or have no home today. And I remember the first time I saw that, I highlighted it. Because um, if I remember, if I, if I my, didn't go back to save my parents at this point, I don't know where I would have went. Um, but to me at the time, it was like the worst thing. Because now it's like, i got to go back home and, you know, just... Uh, for an ego, with an ego like mine, that was you know uh, a bad thing. And, um, so at this point, I went back home to the town I grew up in, and uh, 
I was 26 years old and I felt like my life was over because I had lost everything. And um, so I, at this point, I, I just, you know, I, I, my only solution is to drink. So that's what I would do. I, I would just, I would wake up every day and, and just go down to the, um, you know, convenience store and, and get a $3 and 50 cent bottle of that uh, Russian vodka. And, um, and this is where I noticed that um, a couple of summers ago, I, I worked a catering job and um, uh, we did a lot of weddings. And, um, uh, we do cocktails, you know, like around five o'clock, and it would always surprise me when, when people would um, order these uh, specific drinks because they would like request a specific type of brand, like liquor, or and it's half the times I would have to ask the bartender what it was. And, and, um, and I remember like laughing at myself, thinking I'm an alcoholic and I don't know what you know any of this stuff is. <laughs> and, I, and you know, my point of that is just it didn't matter it, it, to me. Whatever was the uh, uh, cheapest and would get me drunkest the quickest. That's what I was about. And I remember that Russian vodka tasted awful, but again, just like I learned with beer, once you, you know, slam a couple, you know, it's, uh, you know, that buzz kicks in and, you know, it's, it doesn't matter. Um, so, um, so anyway, I, um, you know, at, at this point I would just drink for, um, uh, drink for oblivion. And, uh, you know, the problem with that is that, you know, you wake up from it. <laughs> <coughs> And um, so finally, you know, my, my parents, my parents didn't know what to do with me. They, um, you know, they knew nothing about Al-Anon or anything like that. And, um, you know, and I, I was just, uh, I can remember, you know, not being able to stand to be sober. Just, you know, and I remember waking up in the morning and just those first few seconds of consciousness thinking, you know, uh, you know, I got to go through this again. I don't want to have to, you know, go through this again. I was just tired and uh, really just didn't want to live anymore. And I finally asked my parents to, um, say, if you help me out, you know, I get back down to, to, to Louisville, I'll get my job back, I'll get the girl back, everything will be just like it was, everything will be fine, because I was looking for something on the outside to, to fix me. Um, you know, again, not having no idea I'm, I'm alcoholic and, you know, it's a, um, it, it's a inside job. Um, nothing on the outside would fix me, but, um, yeah, I didn't know this at the time, and um, so they, they agreed to do that, and so I went back down to Louisville, and um, you know, I I, uh, I tried to, to pull myself together for uh, you know for for about two months, or maybe maybe a month, you know, and I, I got a job waiting tables, and I was gonna pull myself up by the bootstraps and work my way back and have this big dramatic comeback story, and, and uh, <laughs> you know, but um, you know, it wasn't long before I was just doing the same stuff, I you know, that I. Uh, um, was doing before, and, and really, I just wanted to be um, around my own friends, have no responsibilities, and, and just drink the way that I like to drink. And um, so, finally, after about I remember uh, about another year of doing this, I went to a walking clinic one day, and I, you know, I, I just knew something was uh, was seriously wrong with me. I, I just I didn't know what. And um, I went to a walking clinic, and uh, I asked. Um, I, I, God spoke through me because uh, I just got honest with the doctor. And I told her, uh, you know, everything that was going on with me, and um, everything, everything that I'd been doing, and um, and I went in asking for, for, for like a pill to fix me, and um, and that's what I asked her. I said, "Can't you like give me something that'll like just kind of like fix me and help me, you know, detox off all this stuff?" I didn't even know what detox meant. I, yeah, I just didn't know, you know, I was ignorant to to, to the, the program, you know, and, and alcoholism, and. Um, and thank God she didn't, you know, she, it, it, what she did was instead, um, she called a treatment center for me and she came back in the office. She said, I called uh, Tenbrook Hospital. They're over on New LaGrange Road. If you want to go, uh, they're waiting for you. And, um, you know, for some reason I went over there and it kind of reminds me today of, of when, um, you know, uh, Bill Wilson asked Dr. Silkworth after his, you know, uh, uh, great white you know, experience in Towns Hospital, and he asked Silverworth, he goes, you know, did I imagine this? Am I crazy? And, and Silver said, Bill, whatever it is, you know, I, 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 uh, I can't explain what happened to you, but I can see the change in you, so I suggest you go with it. And, um, you know, I've heard it said, thank God Silverworth didn't say, Bill, oh, those are dangerous. Here, here's, here's a prescription for something. And that's what I think with this doctor, you know, I'm, I'm glad she didn't just write me a, a script for something. And, and so I went to this, um, I went to this treatment center for some reason, and I, you know, um, I, I say no when I should say yes and I say yes when I should say no but for some reason I went and I remember um, sitting there waiting to have this interview and, and, and I remember thinking you know um, 
I tried to get sober before, it didn't work. This probably is not going to work either. I don't know what this, whatever this is. Um, but I, I went and I, uh, I signed up for their intensive outpatient program, their IOP. Because I remember not wanting to go away to treatment, you know, cause, like I had so much going on. I couldn't you know, go away anywhere. But um, I signed up for their IOP, and I remember um, that was Wednesday, June the 18th of 2008. And uh, I remember I walked in, I signed a few more papers, and uh, uh, they were having a group. Group starting at 9 a.m., and uh, yeah, I didn't know who was who. And everybody started going around the room and giving their sobriety date. And, um, and their name, and everybody I remember had around like, you know, 30 days, which was a big deal to me, because I couldn't stay sober one day. And, and um, when I got to the front of the room, a, a guy uh, introduced himself, he was like the leader of the group, and he said, uh, he was, my name is Bob, and I'm an alcoholic, my sobriety date's November 26, 1989, and I don't want another one. And um, man, that got my attention, because um, one of my favorite speakers talks about, you know, he says, like, intellectually, uh, you, don't, you don't know something up here, but your soul, like, in here, you just know it. And, you, and your soul kind of just, go, when you hear it, you kind of just go, oh, yeah, yeah. And um, look, looking back, that's how I felt when I heard Bob uh, identify himself as an alcoholic. Because even though I didn't believe here I was an alcoholic, it was just, like, intuitively, I knew I was. And I just related to him when he said that. And the other thing that got my attention was he said he'd been sober since 1989. And... Um, and as he would share and he would talk, I was like, man, I could tell. I said, this guy was just like me. And, um, and now look at him. You know, he's got 18 years sober and he's sharp looking and his eyes are clear. And, and uh, you know, Bob was a member of, uh, of, of AA. And I just, I didn't know people did that. I just didn't know people got sober. Like, you know, and um, uh, so I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and, and this place, uh, looking back, I had, the, I had the gift of desperation. And, uh, um, and thank God, because I was, I was just tired of, of just living the way I was living. And, um, you know, I started to work. This, I got a sponsor, and I started to work the steps. And um, I remember just after a couple months, um, I can remember just feeling like a sigh of relief, like, oh, I, I, can, I can breathe a little bit. And, um, and it felt different. You know, it felt funny. I, uh, my buddy Terrence says it the best when he said he had about 90 days, and he went to a sponsor, and he said, man... He goes, something's wrong. Nothing's happening. And his sponsor said, nothing's supposed to happen. Like, You're used to chaos. And uh, that was certainly the case with me. And um, for the first time in my life, I started getting some peace and serenity. And, um, and things, you know, things started to happen. Um, uh, the opportunity came back, back around to get hired with the wrestling company again. And the same guy who fired me, you know, two years before, said I'd probably never work for the company again, um, brought me back, and they, they rehired me, I couldn't believe it, and, um, you know, and, and so, that's what brought me down to Florida, because now they were based out of Tampa, so, um, it was amazing, I, you know, I, I got my job back, and I got to come to, to Florida, you know, I, I would have been happy to go if it was somewhere, you know, in, in like Wyoming, or, you know, someplace that... <laughs> I can't speak about because I've never been there, but yeah, you know, it doesn't seem as fun as Florida to me. And um, but that brought me down here, and, and um, I met my sponsor down here. And um, you know, I, I knew though the first thing because I'd caught the AA buzz. You know, so it was six months when I came down here, but I knew first thing I needed to do was get hooked up with AA down here. And my sponsor actually had just moved from Kentucky about a year before, and um, you know, he's still my he's my sponsor today, and, and I'm really close with him. And uh, so I just got involved in AA down here, and you know, and um, and man, you know, this, um, you know, I, I have a really, uh, really good life today, and that's only as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous and um, and God's grace. Um, you know, and, and I, I, AA gives us the tools to, to deal with things. I, I used to hear people say things like, "Just because you're sober doesn't mean every every meal is a banquet, and every day is a holiday," and and I used to think, well, that's, that's kind of a negative way to look at it. But, um, <laughs> but what, I, what I found out, you know, is, is that, you know, life is going to happen. Things happen. What we have here is the, um, the kid of spiritual tools laid at our, at our feet to deal with life, you know. And um, in my experience, one of the biggest blessings of, of being close with, uh, with my higher power, I call it God, is that, you know, when things do happen or are going to happen, and, and, and my, um, God has used those situations to, you know, mold me and, you know, keep me on his, uh, that's one of my prayers of mine, I always ask just to keep me on, on his potter, uh, potter's wheel, you know, mold me, slap off those rough edges, because um, I need it, <laughs> and, um, you know, but, um, 
and, and uh, um, God will take a situation that was meant for harm and and, uh, and make good from it. And um, I think the biggest example of that, I think we probably all have, is us coming to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because if somebody would have told me in 2007 that you're going to go to AA and you're actually going to love it and you're going to really enjoy it, I, yeah, you know, I wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> but it just proves that, I, you know, I don't know what's, what's best for me. Um, and, and speaking, you know, so things happening, I let's see, it's been about two years now. Uh, after I was back with the wrestling company, for I got to go back with them for two years. Um, and it was great. So everything I had lost before, I got it back and then some. And I, and I got to do it all sober. Um, actually, I got, I got caught up to the to the big show and got to be on TV and, 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 and you know, the magazines and uh, travel to Europe and do all kind of stuff and all kind of neat stuff and share locker rooms with guys I watched when I was a kid. And, and uh, you know, what a blessing. And, and one of the reasons I just mentioned that, though, is because... Um, you know, wrestling used to be like my my main, my only thing in life, and um, all of a sudden, you know, it became it wasn't the most important thing to me anymore. My, my sobriety was, and um, and really just trying to grow and, and you know and, and do God's and do God's will. And uh, so um, I got I got released. Uh, I remember I was sitting at a meeting, a noon meeting. I remember they, the company called. I remember think they called and, and I said, oh, wait, why are they call me on a Friday? Now, that's probably, that's never good when they call you on a Friday. <laughs> and uh, and, and the, the same guy who hired me before and then had to fire me and then hired me back had to call me up and he said, Chris, yeah, I've got bad news. And, you know, we just, uh, th- you know, th- they're releasing me from my contract. But this time it was a completely different conversation than it was two and a half years before. Um, you know, and that's just how it is. It's the entertainment business. That's just the way it goes. And, you know, um, uh, but I, I remember I, I almost couldn't get off the phone with him. You know, he kept saying nice things about me. And um, I almost wanted to be like, John, it's okay. You, know? you guys will be fine. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, that, that's, that's, all from, that's all because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and, you know, and, um, and uh, what I found was that was just a small, one of the biggest blessings of my life today is that was just a small part of my life. You know, I, the things God has laid out for me, um, you know, for all of us, um, you know, and, and again, just more proof that, um, you know, God knows not only what's best for me, but what will make me happy, where I could be most of service to him. Um, my job today, actually, last time I was up here, I was just starting a new job. Uh, today, I'm a, I'm a, a school teacher in Ellsborough County, and, um, and that just happened through, you know, God opening the right doors, one, one just by putting one foot in front of the other and just letting uh, God run the show. Um, and uh, I absolutely love it today. I'm a year and a half in, and um, you know, just the, the way that all went down, I, I, two years ago I never would have you know, picked that out of, a, out of a lineup, saying, oh yeah, I'd like to be a school teacher. Um, <laughs> but I absolutely love it today. It, you know, and I, I've, right on time, God's given me everything I need, uh, you know, um, since I, I I got my degree, I'm out of the, what they call out of field. Um, so there's you know certain tests I need to take and trainings that come up and uh, you know God's gotten me through every one of them. It's just it's amazing. There was a um, th- there was a math test I had, I had to take and I haven't had math since I was a junior in high school. And this was like it's called the general knowledge test. It has English like uh, essay in mathematics and it man, this wasn't no general knowledge when it came to math. <laughs> to me, it wasn't. This is like algebra two and geometry, and to me, that's like heavy stuff. And um, I had to pass this test before June of this past year, and um, yeah, that's what my contract said. And, and uh, that's just how it is in the state of Florida. And um, I, um, so I, I remember having thinking, this is impossible. I'm not. Gonna, what am I gonna? Uh, if I don't pass this test, I lose my job. And. Um, and I tried to study for it, but I couldn't. I, I didn't know how to put any of that stuff together. And so, um, right when I needed it, I found out through the district about a course that was offered. Uh, that actually, because I guess they n- n- figure people are going to have trouble with this mathematics test. So there was actually a course that was offered for free to help you, you know, get through this test. And man, I I went, and it was two nights a week for five weeks, and uh, I I learned everything I needed to know. Um, I remember I took the test on May fifth. I passed it. Couldn't believe it. Um, and that's God does for me what I, I just show up. I, I still have all the notes from that course. When I go back and look at it, I don't remember anything. <laughs> I learned just what I need to know just for that test. It's ama- you know, it's amazing. And uh, so I just really learned to trust God. And, and um, 
that's just you know the, been, been the biggest blessing in my life. Um, you know, it says uh, you know, trust God, clean house, help others, and uh, you know, when I get out of me, um, that's really when I'm the most happy. You know, and again, it's one of those paradoxes that we can I can only learn here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, the, you know, the more we give, the the, the, the more we get. You know, and um, so yeah. Everything I have in my life today is as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the, the biggest thing is my relationship with God, um, which wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for AA, because you guys showed me how to have that relationship through the steps. And uh, so, um, anyway, again, it's just um, always uh, great to come up here. Um, again, thank you to the group for having me up here, and uh, I'll stop there. Thank you.